We're now joined by actor and director Sean Penn, who is the co-director of a new documentary about the war in Ukraine called Superpower. Good morning. Good to have you here. Good to be here. So who do you want to see this documentary? What is your intent? The American people is the primary intent. The American conservatives, the American liberals, everything in between, Republicans, Democrats. This is not a movie that's made for a party. It's not a movie that's made f for anything but to sort of share this experience of Ukrainian courage and, and unity um, in parallel with the fragility of that in our country. And, and, and I hope that it can be sort of a, a bridge uh, internally and that that bridge can lead to uh, a more informed and um, robust support for Ukraine in their fight. You say experience, and it was an experience for you because you went into Ukraine. In fact, uh, a large part of this documentary takes place right around the timing of the invasion, which is just incredible. Um, this was at a time when the United States was loudly warning a full-scale invasion was about to happen. Why did you go despite those warnings? This, is a, this film started as a sort of lighthearted tale of a comedic actor who had become president. A lot of attention had come Ukraine's way, his way, after a controversial phone call with our former president. Um, and there seemed to be this, you know, generating interest. And by sort of a quirk of fate, a friend of mine had run into someone who had connection to Zelensky. And he, he said, do you, what do you think? Should we consider doing a you know, documentary about this um, Ukrainian president? And mm -hmm. it got increasingly interesting, and we started to do that. And then COVID happened. So this is long before, right. you know, the Russian buildup. In context, I know a lot of people forget that the border war had continued in the East since the annexation of Crimea in 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, but largely this was a country at peace of building democracy and, and one that had become sort of a new young Ukraine and young president, um, you know, moving progressively past the kleptocracies and the all of those things Try. that might have, yeah. Well, but, but getting some legislations passed that are more significant than maybe we've paid attention to and that it's a convenient out to not have involved them with NATO, mm -hmm. that's another story. Right. And, and then because of COVID, my first meeting with President Zelensky was over Zoom. And that delayed our being able to start. He, he was intrigued with the idea it was important to me not to, and I told him that I didn't want him to commit to it and then potentially just give us a formal presentation, you know, of who he was when we were there. I wanted him to meet me in person when the time would come without a camera and then see if it felt like we could have an unguarded communication. And, uh, it, and that didn't happen until um, February 23, uh, 2022. The, the day before the full-scale invasion began. So we agreed that we would start shooting on the 24th. Intentionally. Yes. And then we went back to our hotel and tried to lay our heads down. And then the rockets started coming in. And, and, and it was a country at war. And he, this really warm, I've described it a lot, um, intelligent presence that, that of this young president was overnight a wartime president. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised, and, but we got the call from the president's office the morning of saying he would uh, follow through with our plan to start shooting on that day. It's interesting how the Zelensky government has used communication and media and information as part of their strategy. Some of his top advisors came from the entertainment industry. Yep. How, how much of an insight did you get into that, into their strategic planning? Well, I would say I, I probably have a far less cynical uh, perspective on this, so much so that I, I have a little bit of an allergy to the word strategy with this. I think that before he was an actor, and the reason he was a talented actor, there was somebody who had a generous perception of the world that he wanted to share and, and a hunger 
of expression that gave him many ways to express it. That becomes a, a career path, not necessarily by um, you know, uh, intrigue, but simply because that's the outlet for that that you can make a living at. Mm -hmm. And it's a great way to share with people. That then leads to the communicator that is the president, and then with his leadership, and of course colleagues, like you mentioned, brought into the administration, you've got kind of a brave new world of great communicators who understand the new technologies and uh, routes to inform and to share the story of what's happening in their country. In one of the clips, um, Andre Yermak, one of the top advisors to President Zelensky, says to you, you know, the U.S. position should be stronger. If the United States and Joe Biden doesn't do something now, essentially, he says, America's over. That followed with a pretty robust financial investment by the United States, more than $50 billion, uh, pledges of weapons. But from what I've heard you say, you think the United States isn't doing enough. It is my absolute feeling that the caution with which the United States has pledged support, which seemed, in my reading of, of, of uh, February 2020-22, was a, <clears throat> like a lean on in the fear of nuclear conflict, something I think all of us should look very carefully at and understand it of course, is possible, and that's to be concerning. The likelihood is extremely low. And as one of our witnesses in the film uh, says, you know, are we going to let a gangster with nuclear weapons dictate the way we live? So I think that, and that the Ukrainians won't let him do that. So we have to look at the aligned aspiration of what we are as people and as countries and as governments and see that they are the embodiment of what we aspire to. And we should have had F-16s, air defense, long-range weapons, robustly in position long since by now. And the smoke screens that were used about maintenance crews and are they, do they have enough airfields, those were smoke screens. That's a provable fact. The, what do you the, mean by that, a provable <coughs> fact? The, the because the military leaders have backed up President Biden's claims that it's not appropriate or it needs to be Some have, and I, I, and I can't say whether President uh, Biden was misled on this or not, but I've talked to the guys that do it. We know that the, through the, inter the International Legion, for example, there are all kinds of uh, former military uh, all, who are, uh, um, uh, have the skill sets, both from the, the ground support um, mm -hmm. uh, upward with all of these things, uh, who would have even volunteered to uh, supplement while Ukrainians were being trained. We know that the Ukrainians would have been able to train in record time. Nobody was associating these uh, conversations with the adaptability, the way that one might say, okay, you have X amount of disciplines to become a top gun pilot, but you can, tr you can, and th that may take this many months or a year, et cetera, from the current skill sets they have. Mm -hmm. That's true, but what if you train them for one of those skill sets? And that squadron does just that for now. Another squadron's doing this. You could, you, that can go very fast. So. These, these, these were very frustrating things to hear repeated, regurgitated over and over again. I, it, the pr President Zelensky himself, and he, he's genuine in it, is extremely grateful to the United States and the European countries that have contributed. He's had some tense moments during some of these phone calls. And he's President very Biden. grateful. Mm -hmm. um, but I think he also recognizes that, and he says it in the film, that the American people, we, we don't really know what's going on there unless we're in the war fighting it. And he says very clearly, which all the Ukrainian soldiers I talked to have said, and Ukrainians in general, they don't want Americans in the fight. Mm -hmm. They just want the support uh, so that they can use these weapons to, to defend their freedom and, and to save lives and infrastructure. In uh, the documentary, you spoke with a Ukrainian fighter pilot named Juice. I understand was killed later in a training incident. Was your personal connection to him and his the case he made to you part of why you are pushing this point on F-16 so strongly? I was pushing it when I was with Juice and he was alive. 
he dreamt of flying F-16s. His mother I just saw last week, and she described him as yeah, not a military man, and it's true. And I think if you see that in the movie, I mean, if, if one considers uh, the cookie-cutter idea of a military man, I think that he was a man who was born into a time where he had to do this extreme thing, and he did it with poise and, and skill and focus and, and compassion. There's a, a presence in him that really uh, speaks largely about you, uh, you, so many Ukrainians that I've met. And he, so he had come to Washington to lobby for the F-16s and also was buying helmets for his helicopter pilot friends on eBay here to bring back. Um, so it, it was like that. And then I suppose now, what, was it July that it was announced that there would now be an F-16 program, those resources Eventually, yeah. Yeah, over a long period of time. Uh, and what, a couple of weeks later, um, I got the message that he'd been killed. Uh, I, I, I think not only would Juice be alive today if we had been as bold as we like to claim to be historically as a country with mm -hmm. our principles, with our Republicans and our Democrats, with our leadership, the citizenry too, while we were putting all those Ukrainian flags out, we should have been as demand decisiveness in this case because at some point caution becomes cowardice. And I think that we still have a chance because the Ukrainians, what Andrei Yermak said, what you quoted him as saying, they're not there where America is no longer the, whatever one wants to think of it as, the greatest this or that. But there's still an opportunity mm -hmm. for us to do the right thing. And whether it's re Republican or Democrat, whether it's President Biden's administration or not, personally, I think that there's not only a principal win in, in to escalating this, escalating our help of them, I mean, I think there's a political win. Going across the country, especially talking to young people, one of the things that's missing and seems to be attached even to the mental health crisis is a lack of, of clear-minded, proactive will mm -hmm. to lead. And for us to know which direction we want to go as a country. And I think that this is not an ambiguous war. It's a shame that it's a war. But it's also an opportunity uh, for us to uh, improve. 58% of Americans polled by CBS disapprove of the way Joe Biden is handling the situation with Russia and Ukraine. And I'm getting the sense from you, you're disappointed too. Yeah, I respect President Biden very much. There have been a couple of things that I think have been disasters up to this point. I think this is one. And I say this, of course, with one caveat. There should be an implicit understanding be between private citizens and mm -hmm. leaders in government that, you know, there are things that I don't know about, <laughs> things that should be, need to remain classified. Right. So every day, even when I was with Juice, I was privately thinking, yes, it's our job to fight this fight, but privately I was thinking, but maybe they are doing it behind closed doors, and tomorrow we're going to wake up to that mm -hmm. squadron. Um, enough time has passed. I think it's been to date a tragic mistake, and, and I hope and encourage this president um, that he deserves the legacy of doing this properly. Uh, he's been a great public servant, um, clearly a deeply decent man, and and uh, has gotten a lot of great things done despite this division. But there's nothing more important than this right now. And specifically, air superiority is key to it for you. Yeah. Um, polling also shows big majorities of Americans continue to support economic sanctions on Russia. 61% of Republicans, though, say the U.S. should not send weapons to Ukraine. 50% say the U.S. should not send aid and supplies to Ukraine. That is a big shift from where the Republican Party was in terms of in the past being very strong on Russia. Mm. But some of it, in terms of the rhetoric, reflects this sense that America needs to fix itself at home. How do you respond to, to that thinking? I think there's two parts to it, right? You have the part of that that has nothing to do with what we know of as Republicanism or policy, that there's the, the, this 
populist gap issue that's going to become identity politics and, and, and so on. Um, and, and the kind of uh, extreme, the, the, uh, there are extremes on both sides, right. of course, but this extreme on the right, um, I don't think it concerns itself with information. People, that number you quoted, did you say 56 percent? Uh, 61 percent don't want to send weapons. 50 right. percent say don't send aid or supplies. So housed within that 61 percent, of course, some identify the way, or I would identify the way that I just said. But I believe that most, given it, the simple truth of it, mm -hmm. not the smoke screens and confusion, a context of understanding what the implications are for us, not only Sean Penn talking about the principle, but practically, economically, long term. I think there's more than a compelling argument that would change those minds. Mm -hmm. And I understand why they're confused. I mean, I'm hoping in its little way that, that this film can help context. I would be confused if I hadn't had the opportunity to do this. Yeah. Better communication of the why and the justification yeah, I think for the our, billions of dollars. Of yeah, if the spending. current leadership would just do one thing now, it would be the president saying to his cabinet, we are not spinning the story on Ukraine anymore. So if it's about what are they capable of, we're going to let our commanders in Fresno at the Cal National Guard that's been doing joint ex military exercises with them for 30 years tell us what their capability is. And we're going to say it unfiltered to the American people. Um, one of the people you interviewed, the central bank head, said to you, World War III has begun and Ukraine is the front line. Some people look at that and say that that's just hyperbole. You seem to really believe that, that there is more at stake in this conflict than just the territory in Eastern Europe. Yeah, I don't know that I would use the same words. He, by the way, is one of the more impressive people I've ever met, and I, and I, and I, and I you know, I don't disagree with it. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends on how one means it. I think that what's clear is that we're going to have inevitable confrontations with the existence of nuclear weapons for a long time. We made a sacred oath in the Budapest Memorandum mm -hmm. to Ukraine. Back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. They had the third largest nuclear arsenal in the world. Because of been being part of the Soviet Union, right? right? And they gave that up. They gave it up in exchange for the United States' assurance that even a threat against their sovereignty would be met with unified military support. Mm -hmm. Russia also agreed to this. And <clears throat> I don't think there's anything to believe but that if we don't take it on bravely and boldly now, just with a full understanding of the worst case scenario being horrible, that that's our real world and either we're going to deal with it or our children are going to deal with it. And I think this is it morally politically, economically, um, for sure I am with what Andre Yermak said about the end of the aspiration that's America if we don't. The aspiration, what, what we say we are and we stand for. That's right. Um, you end the documentary talking about this feeling of unity you had when you were in Ukraine and you compare it to what you see here at home and you actually end on the images of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the congresswoman, mm -hmm. um, and Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, of Georgia. And you say, we're going backwards. Why do you think they symbolize that? I think that we've come to a point <clears throat> where we as, as the voters, we as the citizens, have to look at our politicians and say, look, you're very smart. We agree with your policy. Um, why would you want to call it socialist? Why, why would you want to put up a middle finger to people who have a reaction to that? You're a leader. Just get the policy across. Just go to them and say, 
Did your, are you glad your grandmother was able to call 911 when somebody was breaking into her home? And what credit card did she use? Oh, she didn't use a credit card? Well, that's what you're calling socialism. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested in these people self-celebrating or grandstanding. Jerks like me do enough of that. Leaders can't do that anymore. And so on the right, on the left, we have to demand that people actually are accountable for the, the accountable and ourselves for the division that we have and break it. Are you saying there that there's this, because I've heard others say this, lawmakers are trying to be celebrities. Lawmakers are trying to get attention and not focused enough on solving real world issues. It sounds kind of like what you're driving at there. Yeah, I, I, you know, there'll be the arguments. We're in those conversations all the time that this is a function of our electoral system and, the, and campaign financing, and that's all true. And, you know, people keep uh, strategizing by that means they're going to be, you know, looking back at the dust. The, the last B will die, and we'll count down four days. I think we'll leave it there. <laughs> not, I wanted to share one thing with you, though. Yeah, go that, ahead. Um, uh, is that, um, and it's a rare thing that uh, the, uh, uh, the, the powers that be around the, the stakeholders in the superpower movie uh, from Paramount Plus, Vice, Fifth Season, all of those who might, you know, who have already made investment in it, and God knows their businesses. Um, have agreed and supported uh, same-day uh, distribution on full access on all the major networks in Ukraine with Ukrainian subtitles, oh, day, wow. day and date with uh, the streaming date here on the 18th. So I, I sort of wanted to thank them. So people in Ukraine on Monday will Monday be able to watch this too. Yeah. Thank you, Sean thank you. Penn, for sharing your work with us. And Superpower debuts on Paramount Plus on Monday, as you heard. We'll be right back.